Welcome everyone. Welcome back. And welcome if this is the first time you've attended one of our webinar sessions. I'm Simon, this is Darren. As usual, I'll give you the informal or the formal introductions in a second. But I we just as usual, we want to make sure this is all working okay. Hi Damien. Hi from Toronto. Hi Stephen. In fact, I've got a treat for you. We've got um we're gonna use the technology in the webinar software. I'm just gonna ask you a poll. What your, what your 3D discipline is, because it'd just be interesting for us to find out. Um, hi from Rotterdam. Hi, Rob. Hi from Poland. Hi, Damien. <laughs> hi from Berlin. Hi, Linda. So we're just interested if you are um, looking at this poll, if you just choose what your specialism is, including multiple ones. Um, that just helps us craft future versions of these webinars. So I'm just going to leave it up there for a few more moments. I know that lots of you are clicking on this. All of the above. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Yes, it most likely is in 3D land. Absolutely. OK, I'll give you a few more moments for that. Most of you have voted for it. Um, so it's also, as well as being useful for us to find out what your backgrounds are, it's also useful to make sure all the system is working. <laughs> and so let's share the results. So what have we got here? We've got a, a mixture of people today that, that have voted. A lot of MoGraph, as we would have expected, but I've got a lot in 3D design and VFX as well and visualization. So that's, that's useful to know. Thank you. So let's hide those results. That's cool. So here's the official welcome. <laughs> yeah, it's useful information, isn't it, Darren? This is Darren Frankovitz, our excellent trainer. Mm -hmm. From, from Maxon. Hi, I'm Simon Walker. I'm Director of Training with Maxon. And as you're probably aware, we like to run these series of series of webinars where we can share with you the sorts of training that we do for the volume customers and sort of give you an insight to the, the custom training we can run for your team if you've got a team of users. And if you do have an interest in that, please let me know. I'm just using this PDF that I've got on the screen here. This is the one that's in the chat box so you can download this PDF to book on to tomorrow's sessions or just to give you a reminder about all the amazing things that Darren has done but also the email address for contacting us if you want some follow-up questions about today's session so please do that and those are the two blue links in the PDF and if you hover over them they just turn into a little clickable icon great so today let's see it seems to be all working so I'm gonna hand over to you Darren Okay. I think that's a record for preamble, isn't it? <laughs> Did it in under two minutes? <laughs> very, very Excellent. quick. Very nice. So yeah. let me, very quick. I, I think people have experienced this before, so <laughs> let's so spare them the pain. Let's make you a presenter, Darren. Okay. And as usual, everyone, please feel free to ask questions as we're going through. We have the, the questions area, and I'll try and interrupt Darren as where relevant or if I can't we'll see if we can have a few minutes at the end to actually catch up with questions but we like to just jump in and get started because especially today we've got so much to share yeah we're using Redshift <coughs> so what what okay. are we looking at today? Though? so uh, we are looking at uh, materials and Redshift today and I'm going to be going through um, uh, a basically a breakdown of the materials here. Um, I'm going to do a, you know, a little bit of um, building, uh, material building for you guys to see how I'm working with the nodes. And um, we're going to be seeing a lot of layers. Um, the, the star of this project for me, um, other than just a vehicle for me to get into and learn Redshift, uh, was I really love these metal ceiling tiles. So that's what this is about for me. I'm going to start out with some um, super fast, easy bits. Um, and um, I'm also going to, so I'm just going to start out with something called Bridge from Quixel. And um, I'll show you a filter in Photoshop that I used in the tiles, but I'm just going to jump into it instead of telling you everything I'm going to do. So um, I'm actually going to, so this is the final render. Now, what um, I'm going to end up with today is not going to be exactly this. This is, you know, a, a, a long time um, that I put into this and 
just fiddling and tweaking and iterating. And uh, we don't have that time today. So um, hopefully the results will be similar, but we shall see. So uh, here is the current state of my scene. Let me uh, render that so you can see what is and what is not. Um, now I'm on a laptop. Um, it's, you know, so it's not a, a huge display. Um, is this, uh, how, how's the size of this render on your end, uh, Simon? Yeah, pretty so good. I make pretty it? good. Okay. It's about a third of the screen. Okay. Maybe a little more than a quarter. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to um, start out with a wood material, and I'm actually going to get this from Quixel Bridge, which is uh, actually this um, really awesome program, which I'm starting up right now, uh, where Quixel's um, motto is scan the world. And basically what they do is they go around to different geographic locations and they do a lot of uh, 3D scanning. Um, and they get a lot of models and they generate um, levels of detail and um, texture maps for them. So like for example, this limestone quarry is, there's actually a collection of assets. This, these are actually, let me move this little thing here. These are actually um, some assets that were used in that Unreal Engine tech demo. And these are all 3D scans. So we can like select one and uh, preview it um, in 3D. We can actually check out the different texture maps that are generated from that uh, uh, scan data. But I'm actually just going to um, get a surface. So this is like considered an imperfection or a dry map. Um, but there's a wood in here that I want. So let's go to the wood category and here it is, this poplar. And we can even preview the texture maps. And the way that we get from here to Cinema 4D, oops, is simply clicking on this export button. This, uh, this is like a one, it's a one click workflow. You know, you pick what you want and then I'm going to click on export and then I get a message up here, suc export successfully. And when I go back to Cinema 4D, then it is actually right here. So let's uh, pause the Redshift render view. So it just added that to the scene. And if I had this selected, it would apply it automatically. So let me do this one more time, I'm deleting that. I'm actually going to select the object that I want to put the material on. So I'm going to go with fan blades group and then back in bridge, click on export. Watch, it's probably not going to work <laughs> knowing uh, my luck. Nope, it did it. Awesome. So now you can see that material is on that group and it's added there. Um, so that's excellent. Let's start that render. Okay, there we go. So, um, you know, one issue that I had with applying the wood material to these blades is that they're all, they all have identical grain. So one thing that I did to add some variation was, uh, well, first I went into the mapping of these and let's see, let's see, let's see. and I did like, um, I don't know, one and uh, I don't know, 1.5 for the tiles, just to make it a bit more narrow there. It's a little more elongated. Um, and that's on the whole group. So what I can do is then um, take this material. Now, let me actually, I haven't even shown you this yet. What did I get from Bridge? I actually got this Redshift material with all the nodes already set up. So the normal, the roughness, the albedo, it's already set up. And one of the great things about this workflow is that I don't have to go in to the albedo settings and worry about, do I have to override 
the gamma? Is it sRGB? Is are the normals? You know, I it just sets it up for me, and it's wonderful. Um, this workflow they're always um, improving, but it's an excellent starting point if nothing else. Darren, I know you briefly yeah. mentioned this, but we had a question about does the download export directly into Cinema? I just wondered if you could quickly point that out again. Yeah, that's actually uh, what I uh, just did. So let me get a, let me do it again with a different asset, with a different material. So I'm going to go back Great. here and I'm going to grab a uh, a metal. So let's say um, here is a steel. I'm going to simply click on um, export, but actually. I want to make sure I don't have anything selected because I don't want to apply it. Um, or you know what, why not? Okay, so I'll just click on the export in the in that services thing and look right, export successfully, wonderful. And then we come back here and I mean, before it even pops up, I, it's already being rendered on those fan blades, they're now steel. So that's it, that's how you get from bridge into uh, Cinema 4D, you just click on that export button. Fantastic. Um, and a quick and, quick follow up yeah. from yeah, yeah. Blandina. Which specific light setting do you have in Redshift at the moment? I know which, we're doing lights tomorrow, but just whilst yeah, we're. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be getting into lights tomorrow. Um, uh, so but I'm using uh, two area lights a and a skylight uh, right now. So. Um, Yes, I hope that answered that question. So let me get the wood material back on here. And uh, then, like I said, um, by going into this material, um, creating a, a duplicate of it. Uh, let's see, here we go. So here I have uh, some variations and the variations are actually in the texture remapping. I just, change the scale, change the offsets, and then applied that to a different fan blade. So if we're looking at, oh, let's get rid of that. This one, and then let's put this right here. Uh, so you can see that these have different uh, grains on them. Uh, this one's actually going the wrong way, but you know, not a big deal. Um, Do you need a plug-in to inside Cinema? It, it comes with Bridge. Pixel. Comes that with Bridge. Plugin comes with Bridge. Um, it is like in you know when you go into uh, you know the settings, you actually tell it which program uh, you want to export to. So I can go to the um, export settings and choose you know blender unity maya 3ds max unreal engine um houdini uh, marmoset set mixer you know um but yeah i got cinema 4d and then um there's some additional documentation for the plugin um but it automatically is uh, it installs automatically so you don't have to really worry about it cool thanks yeah welcome okay so um the Next bit I'm going to focus on here is the uh, this motor um, for the fan, this housing. Um, and I'm actually going to uh, build this one up. So uh, I'm going to actually create a totally new Redshift material here. And I'm going to go ahead and apply it to the, to, to, um, I guess the fan motor and blades group. So we'll just put that on there and let's open up this material. So whenever I'm working with a redshift material, the first thing I do is I decide what type of preset I'm going to use. Um, these are also great starting points for pretty much anything. Uh, so I'm gonna go with, uh, let's say platinum. And there we go. And what I want this to have is like a uh, like a brushed 
um, metal look to it. Um, let's see, bear with me here. I did forget to open up my reference. Um, I'm using this free program called Pure Ref, which allows you to basically add any images um, from anywhere on your machine. And this is like always going to be uh, on top. Um, and well, actually, I guess I turned it off. Um, and it can also, um, you know, we can have transparency and we can zoom in and, you know, we can move these around. And uh, it's, it's just really great for always having your reference up in front of you. Um, so I wanted um, a, uh, a scratched metal surface. Let me go ahead and minimize this. Um, and fortunately, in Cinema 4D's content browser, there are some presets uh, that work perfectly for this. So um, I'm going to go to the content browser. I'm going to do a search. And I'm looking for anisotropic scratch maps. So I'm going to type in ANI, Annie, and do a search. And here are the two maps that I'm going to use. These are just some other models and presets. Um, so I'm just going to take, let me open these up um, so you can see them. So the first one I'm opening, this is the radial uh, scratch map. OK. Um, and then there is, uh, and I want that to be on the bottom and top of that motor. And then this one is the uh, linear scratches that is going to go around on the sides. So I'm just going to drag these down into the redshift uh, shader graph. So let's see, this is the linear, this is the one on top is the radial. And whenever I'm applying um, a shader or a texture, I always want to sort of, you know, I always need to see how it looks before I get too carried away. So what we can do is just simply connect that texture to the output node, to that surface port. And then it pops up right there. Um, and let's see, let's, uh, so now that I'm actually only interested in this bit, I'm gonna use this render region here in the Redshift render view and zoom in a bit for you guys. So we can see how those scratches are warping. This has everything to do with the UVs that are on this model. I don't wanna mess with UVs. And fortunately there is a something called triplanar mapping. That's a node in Redshift also in Cinema 4D's node system. Um, and I can find it by going to the find, find nodes field here and typing in tri, and oop, there it is, triplanar. So I can just drag this in and I'm gonna put this texture into the triplanar in uh, ImageX. And I'm gonna send this, uh, actually set up a keyboard shortcut for this command right here. Connect node to output. Um, so I can just select a node and hit control enter and it connects it. So now we can see that just that radial scratch map, it still looks weird. And that's because it's really not positioned where I want it. I need to offset it a bit to get it centered on here. Now on the sides, it does not look right. Um, on the bottom, it's okay. It's still pretty difficult to see. So let me, um, just to show you this, I'm gonna add something called a ramp node. And this is, uh, this is my favorite node for whenever I'm tweaking um, like blacks or whites or grayscales on something um, like this. So I'm gonna send the texture into this ramp and then put the ramp into a planar. Now in that ramp, I simply have this gradient, which I can uh, bring in like so. So I'm only making this more pronounced so you guys can see it more clearly. Um, because in the uh, triplanar, it's applying this one image to the X, the Y, and the Z. I actually want this other image to go into the, I just control click drag to make a copy of the ramp. And 
I actually want the linear scratches to go into the image, um, oh, the image C and the image X. So I did, uh, I made a little mistake there. I want the radial scratches to go on the Y axis so that they're only on the top and the bottom. Let's, uh, now what we're seeing is just um, the linear scratches. And that's because I have to turn off this checkbox, same image on each axis. As soon as I turn that off, it updates. And now I get the radial scratches on the bottom and top and the linear scratches on the side. I'm gonna increase the width of this blend area by increasing the blend amount in the triplanar mode. And this is much better. I'm much happier with this. Um, and so now that I have this set up, where am I using it in my material, which I just sent back in here? There's a number of different places to put this. Um, one place that uh, I'm gonna start out with is the bump, okay? So uh, I'm going to actually reset, because this is going to bump, I'm now gonna reset these ramps. Um, <laughs> and I can always uh, play with them later, me too. Uh, so what you need to do is connect this to the materials overall bump input. Now there's also a coding bump. There's a separate bump for the coding of the redshift material. Um, the redshift material has these base properties, the diffuse, the color, the reflection, um, the refraction, there's subsurface single scattering, multi-subsurface, and then here's an a, 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 additional coding. Ooh, I barely got those words out. Um, so if I go back here, turn the main reflection off, what you're seeing here is just that coding. So it can have its own bump. Um, so I'm not gonna worry about that right now. We're gonna go back to the main reflection here. And I'm actually gonna connect this triplanar node to that overall bump input. And we're gonna see something, there's certainly some sort of difference, but I'm not really feeling that, that bump. So I actually need to connect a bump map node to that bump input. So I'm gonna do a search for that node. There we go, bump map, drag that in, connect the triplanar node to it, its texture input, and then send that bump map node out to that bump input. And now we're getting something that we can actually control. I can actually go to the bump map uh, node and turn down that height scale to like points, I don't know, one eight. Um, so it's not quite so dramatic. So I'm getting some of those scratches in there. Um, can you see those okay on your end or should I make it more pronounced? Simon. It'd be nice to just zoom in to see a couple of the scratches. Sure. It's possible. So let me actually go to my view and jump out of my camera. And I'll just come in here. Uh, let's turn off the render region. So it's... um. Yeah, so is that a little is that a little better? Yeah, you can certainly clear I hope see those lines. Um, so we are seeing that bump effects. Another place where we can use this is, um, you know, if we're actually going for some anisotropic scratches, <clears throat> we can use the anisotropic uh, channel here. Um, now, what you'll find with the these materials, um, let's see, redshift material is that we don't have strength 100%, right? 0%, it's basically zero to one. So one is your 100%, weight is essentially strength. Um, and uh, here we have anisotropy. So I'm, uh, and, and pointing that out because here I have the grayscale values 
So white is 100% uh, strength and black is 0% strength. So I'm gonna take this triplanar node, which has all those scratches, and I'm going to, let's actually disable the bump map temporarily. I'm gonna connect that triplanar node with the scratch maps to the reflection aniso, that's the anisotropy. So you can see right now it's without that uh, anisotropic scratches. Now I'll connect it, it will update, and we're starting to get, it's, it's different. What's going on? It's actually stretching the reflection essentially. Um, and that can be rotated. Um, so, but I actually, you know, prefer this um, elsewhere. So there's a couple ums for you guys. So another place I'm gonna show you is the reflection roughness. This is one of the default places where we tend to see uh, grime maps and uh, similar textures being used. So that's actually not bad. Let's jump back to the camera and see how it looks from the camera's view. And you know what, I don't mind that at all. I think I'm going to stick with that. Um, I, let's see on time. So I'm actually gonna move on to the tiles now. Um, let's see, any questions real quick about what I've done here, uh, the tray plan, anything? Not so far. This this is an interesting thing that you you mentioned about the triplanar switching off those different axes because there's a similar setting in cinema, isn't there? Um, I believe so. It's been a while since I've looked at the Cinema 4D node uh, no, uh, equivalent, um, but it will just take one second jumping to a new project and creating a new node material, and then let's check this out. Um, so let's go to, we can search just the same way here, like we do in the redshift shader graph. So I'll go try, there we go, look, try planar, boom, right there, uh, drag that in. And this has all those, you know, very similar options. Um, interestingly, I do not see a checkbox for same image on each axis, um, but, you know, you can just connect them. Uh, Got so, it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's close this here. And you know, while I'm here, let me point out with the Cinema 4D node system, you can actually do have both um, Cinema 4D or Redshift nodes in here. Right now, we have this node space option, and it's doing whatever the computer is, but if I go to the basic properties for the material, I can add a redshift node space. And then when I, oh, it's calculating. Please don't crash. <laughs> this is something that I have not tried. So you never know. Um, but anyway, you can add, um, a basically a hidden node setup for a different render engine. Uh, so when you switch between render engines, the material, um, it's the nodes will be replaced with that render engine's nodes. Now you do have to set up those nodes. It doesn't automatically convert them or anything, but there it does uh, give you a lot of flexibility. Um, I think I'm going to have to. Um, force quit and restart cinema. So I'm going to uh, pause my screen share. Uh, let's see, pause showing my screen. Yeah, so bear with me, everyone. No worries, whilst you're doing that, um, Darren, we mm -hmm. had a couple of questions about a Mac version and using Redshift on a Mac. And we had a question earlier on about with AMD cards. And the the answer is soon. I know we've said soon before, but as I mentioned earlier on, I think yesterday, we mean it this time. And uh, it's public knowledge that we're working on the Mac version and we are, we are working very hard to make this happen. So thank you for your patience. Appreciate that. You're, you're not the only ones that are asking. So we're, we're um, aiming to make sure that we can, um, we can do this. So 
Again, you can, you can tell I'm not really answering the question. <laughs> that's, that's as much as I can say at the moment. But um, again, thank you for your patience. Yeah, I can't wait till that comes out so that it, uh, so that everyone can start um, enjoying the speed and the workflow. Because um, you know, one of the things I love about the material system is is my screen live again on your end, Simon? Yes, you're back. Okay. One of the things I love about it is that it is actually sort of simpler. It's a little more straightforward than the uh, Cinema 4D material system um, where you have so many different channels. You know, here you have basically color reflection, transparency, you know, everything's categorized in a very easy uh, streamlined way. And I love that. Um, let me get the wood material. But, well, you know, we'll just move on. So um, let's see, I did lose that some textures here, but fortunately, I have backups, so let's get, yeah. We do have a node question whilst you're getting set up there, Darren. Mm -hmm. uh, Jake's asking, must the Trapliner node connect into the Redshift Material node, or can it ever go directly to the output node? Um, repeat the question, please. Does the triplanar node have to connect into the material node, or can go go just into directly into the output? Uh, actually, yeah, I was connecting it to the output so that I could preview it. But you do because it's actually changing how the textures are being projected. Um, let's see if I can. Find one here. Um, interesting. Um, because it actually changes how those textures are being uh, projected, and then those textures are being used in uh, on you know on the model. It it does like in reflection, not like the whole thing. Uh, you do want to send it to a uh, material channel. Um, but let me, uh, so actually I'm gonna show you that in just a moment here. Um, I wanna get to the tiles uh, for the ceiling because that was like sort of the main, uh, my, my goal for this project. Um, now I you know can't draw a straight line. I can't draw a smooth curve without awkward curves scattered around it. So um, gosh, that sounds horrible. Uh, but uh, fortunately, in the content browser, there is a texture that I found. Um, I actually saved it. So let me show that to you. And it's this Spain 6x6 all. It has all these different tiles. It's actually from a scene in the content browser. And I don't need all of them. I just need this one. So what I did was I took this image copy from the picture viewer here. I'm going to go to Photoshop and I'm going to create a new document and uh, let's do that um, clipboard size there. And because I'm actually, what I'm doing here now in Photoshop is I'm going to convert that tile into a displacement map. I actually want this to be at least 16 bit. So we'll create this texture and then I'm just going to paste that layer in and I'll just get that one tile there. I uh, just made a square selection and I'll go ahead and crop that. And let's, oops, let's, uh, oh my goodness. What is going on with me? Ah, <laughs> okay fit on screen. I swear I know how to use Photoshop. I have opened this before. Um, so with the that one tile, um, I, it always makes me nervous to have a selection. Uh, there is this 3D filter, generate bump height map. You can also generate a normal map, but I wanted the displacement map. Uh, so I select that filter. And basically what it does is it 
blurs um, the you know the edges. You know, looking at the 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 low, the mid, and, and the high points, and boy, it's taking a while to pop up here. Um, and wow, did I did I just not click on it or something? Let's try that again. Generate bump. Wow. Okay, so it's not popping up, but what I end up with uh, when I used it was, uh, let's see, open recent. Uh, there we go. Uh, loading that image. Uh, was this. So it has these blurred areas. Um, there's these gradients all around here. And the filter gives you a lot of control over that. This was the first time I used it and um, it, it worked out okay. Um, I was happy with it. So let me close Photoshop. Let's close this. And uh, I'm gonna go to um, the this material here. And let's create a new Redshift material. Let's turn off the renderer temporarily. Okay, awkward. Redshift materials material. There we go. Finally, uh, again, I'm going to go to the presets and let's start with, let's say, copper. Um, I certainly want this to have that sort of copper, brown, gold, yellowish uh, look to it. Now, remember earlier when I was working with bumps, I made a big deal about you need to connect your bump maps to a bump map node. We need to do the same thing with displacement. So let me get my displacement map in here. I'm just dragging it from my content browser where I, I have a catalog of assets. A catalog is like a, um, not actually a folder. It just sort of references files in a little collection so that you can refer to them and add them without having to go through all of your uh, folders and such. So let's see, I got that height map or displacement. Now I'm going to add the displacement node and I'm going to connect this texture to that displacement node texture text map input. And this is actually going out to the output node, not the material. We're not actually applying displacement to, a, to a, a material node, we're applying it to the final output. So there is that displacement um, displacement map. Now, um, let's actually apply this material to the tile because we're not really seeing anything. Uh, it's under environment and tiles cloner right there. So let's drag that on. And let's start our uh, interactive progressive render. So we have that on there, but I'm not seeing the displacement. Um, the displacement node has the scale or strength, and I should see something, it's at one, but I actually need to add a tag, this tag, the redshift object tag. So on the tiles cloner, I'm gonna go redshift tags and add the redshift object tag. Anytime you're doing displacement, you need to add this tag. So in the settings for the tag, what you need to do then is under geometry, you need to enable override. So now you can get to these settings and you need to enable tessellation. This is basically the, uh, the subdivision that is applied, but it doesn't actually move or displace those subdivisions until you then enable the displacement checkbox. Now we're getting that displacement, but with a very undesirable smoothing. And that is removed simply by unchecking this smooth subdivision box. Now, um, let's see, I want this to be stronger. So I'm going to go to the maximum displacement and set that to two and the scale to three. And that's going to bring this out to a level that I'm happier with. Um, now let's 
actually jump into the default camera so you guys can see that. Okay, and part of what I was able to accomplish with the redshift nodes and layering them up was to create, um, where is it? Here we go, if I zoom in on this Google image search, you can see there are uh, some different styles of these tiles. And I really liked this one. Uh, so basically this is like two different materials that we want to uh, layer up. So I'm actually going, and we have a very similar thing going on here with the grime, right? Um, so let's uh, let's minimize this guy. And uh, let me show you how to layer uh, materials up. So uh, I'm actually gonna use a preset material that I like for this. Let's go to the content browser. I got this uh preset material from pixel lab um, it's actually a sample pack of uh, pixel lab uh, redshift materials and here we go it's the which one is this redshift mutating metals sampler and i'm going to go with this copper corroded material i'm just going to drag that down to add it to my scene and you know, what we do in Cinema 4D is we can actually stack up tags and have transparency to see through one material to the one underneath, but Redshift doesn't really care about stacked materials in the material tags over here. It only cares about the rightmost texture tag or material tag. So um, we need to do that all in the shader graph. So I'm actually gonna go to the copper and there's a couple of things that I need to do here um, to set this up. And it's all about the tri-planar. So I'm just gonna set one up, oh, texture, um, image X, let's go up there. And then I'm going to control click drag, control click drag, control click drag, just duplicating it. And then I'm going to um, connect all these. Whilst you're Sorry. connecting those, Darren, I've got a quick question from Spencer. Mm -hmm. Are you able to just explain maximum displacement slider versus displacement scale? Oh, man. Uh, who, who was that? That was Spencer? Spencer, yes. Spencer. I mean, Spencer he's understanding. Oh, sorry, I, am calling, I am calling you out, sir, because you have asked the question I was hoping no one would ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's something that I've been fiddling with um and i have not you know I, I don't really get i do know that in the um i can tell you that the where we at do, 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 tiles cloner there we go um that the displacement scale is um uh basically the same essentially um as this setting here in the displacement node Okay, um, so it's it's you know an overall scale or strength. Um, the maximum displacement is, is I can't explain it, but what you can do, um, and I've done it, I still don't get it, is in the redshift menu go help and uh, online manual. Um, then would you say would you say that maximum displacement could be a clamp for scale? Sounds like you know. Sounds like you know something. Or you, that's what he's asking. Better <laughs> it's, um, uh, that's not me. I'm not. Unfortunately, be. I'm the same as you, Darren. I also don't know. So let's see. Tessellation and displacement. I just did a quick search, and here we go. Maximum displacement. Um, so it is actually described here, um, and there's some great examples. That's just overall scale. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it could be like a clamp. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but now that I have all of these bits set up with the triplanar node, I need to add them to, let's 
get back over here and let's, okay. Let's make this a uh, bigger render and bear with me. I want to adjust the size of this so you guys can see a little better. Oh gosh, how am I doing on time, Simon? Dare I ask? About 20 minutes, just under. Okay, that's good. We're good. Um, let's see, let's go to um, original size with the render region. Um, and excellent. So now I can give you that full resolution uh, with a smaller window. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to select all of these nodes. Um, every, basically everything other than the output. Uh, from this preset material. And I'm going to Command or Control C to copy them. And then I'm going to go to the material where I want to add them. And I actually have to click in the shader graph and then paste. Um, you may have to like zoom out and find where it pasted it because it doesn't always go where you think. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to move that down there. All those connections are maintained, which is excellent. Um, and let's come in here, move this over. Let's uh, resize this guy. Let's go like so. Um, and I have basically my one material here. And then I have this other material that I want to be like just sort of in the crevices, all that weathering, that uh, tarnished copper. So to find those crevices, I use a special node called the curvature. Okay, uh, I'm going to drag, drag that in and connect that to the output so we can immediately preview that. So it's very similar to ambient occlusion if you're if you've heard of that before, if you're familiar with it, except it's actually looking at the um, convex and concave curves of the geometry. So uh, in that in this node. I can choose convex or concave, which in fact is what I want. And I would actually like these white bits to be a bit more white. So I'm sure somewhere with these sliders, I can accomplish that, but I like something a little more visual and interactive. So again, I'm gonna drag that ramp node and connect the curvature to the ramp and then send that ramp out to the Output. So now in the ramp, I can just bring that white knot in. And there we go. Now we're getting more white uh, like I want. Um, so this is where I want that dirtier material. And then the black parts are going to be the cleaner metal. So this is basically like a mask. So how do we, where do we apply this mask and where do we combine these materials. Well, the materials are combined using a blender node, a actually a material blender. Note there is also a bump blender and a displacement blender. So you can combine different displacements from different materials together. But um, let's see, I need that material blender node. And the base material is this guy up here. That's the one that I um, created. It's going to be the base color, which I'm now sending to the output. And um, there we go. And then the and there it is. Uh, and then the second layer is going to be this material. In, uh, I'm going to put that right into the material blender layer one. Now we have the layer color, and then the blend color. And that blend color is going to be this ramp. So now I'll connect that. So again, white is basically um, like 100% strength, um, like 100% opaque, and black is uh, completely transparent. Um, so now we're getting some grime just in the nooks. Um, and uh, you know, spending more time on this, we can add additional layers and add noises and layer those and you know, get something much more um, complex and subtle and real and interesting, you know, whatever you want. Uh, so I'm coming back to the camera view. Um, in the time that we have left, there's a couple more things that I want to uh, show you guys here. Um, and that is 
the um, this gl the glass. This is another blended material. Let me get to uh, temporarily pausing my screen share. Don't don't worry. We'll be right back. I just want to get this render up without you guys seeing how messy my desktop is. <laughs> There we go. A messy uh, desktop okay. is a sign of a busy 3D professional. Uh, or an unorganized <laughs> professional. Um, okay, so uh, back to the render. We can see that this, we have this um, like milky glass dome that is like melting and turning into something like a fluid. So this is another ma uh, material blend, okay? so. Um, we have a, another blend going on with the chain going from a like a, a silver uh, chrome ball chain into bubbles. We're, we're going to be doing that tomorrow and also these spider webs tomorrow. Um, but let's talk about this guy here, that bulb. So um, let's zoom in and I'm going to get my render region up over it I wish it could just read my mind and automatically adjust the view uh, to my to my liking. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and again create a, a new. You know what? Let's with the time we have left, I'm going to break this down for you rather than uh, rebuild it up. Um, so I actually have that material. Oh, brain not working. Must find uh, the ceiling fan. Yeah, there we go. Um, uh -huh. So when you have too many uh, too many hours in a project and you don't optimize your files, you end up with a lot of things stacking up in your projects like I have here. I got so many backup assets. So here is the material. Uh, let's make that bigger so you can see it. Um, now the displacement is not on. Uh, and again, anyone, anyone want to guess why? Let me show you this material. We have a displacement blender. We have displacement with a value. Anyone want to guess why there's actually no displacement here? Anything? See anything, Simon? <laughs> I'll let you know when they do. Okay. In yeah, no five tag seconds. says Richard. Boom, Richard. No Richard tag says Mike. Richard and Nico. Has, oh, there you go. Bingo, bingo. Uh, winner, winner. Richard's won dinner. the virtual prize. <laughs> whatever that is yeah that's all you simon please contact simon <laughs> redeem your prize whatever he decides Rich, it may Richard not has won be. the congratulations of the group <laughs> <laughs> um yes yeah, the tag so i'm just going to go ahead and add uh the tag from my backup haha <laughs> told you um and yep there we go there we go now we can see that displacement so what how is this blending occurring because this is not actually based on a curvature. This isn't based on um, ambient occlusion or you know, convex concave surfaces. This is actually from a vertex map. Okay, so if you're already familiar with using vertex maps in Sim 4D, then I'm now going to show you how you can use them in Redshift. So here is the vertex map that I created. Okay, it's really simple. Um, and there it is, it's named vertex map because I'm so original. And let's look at this material and break it down. So um, we have a surface material blender here. The base material is this emissive material, which is the white, um, white glowy material. Uh, that did not. Control, enter. Huh, that's, huh, that should have gone to the surface. Interesting. Um, so let's just read. So there you can see that the displacement is still there because that's actually not in the material. It's 
connected to the output node. Okay, so uh, this material is really only a Fresnel shader or a Fresnel node with all the default settings here. And that's going into this ramp. The only thing that this ramp has done is basically, this is the default settings for this ramp. I simply inverted that gradient, okay? Um, and that goes into the standard redshift material. Um, I, you know, I think I probably started out with plastic or something, but it's just like a full reflection, uh, no roughness, and uh, that's it. But it, that ramp with that Fresnel is going into this emission. And then I actually added a bit of a tint here. But the thing is, you have to set the weight to one. If it's at zero, then uh, you get no emission. You just get you know, everything else. So we put the emission weight up to one. And another thing that is good is to, if you want to get that tint, enable this overall tint effects emission in the advanced tab. So that's a little heavy handed. Uh, so I can go back here and dial that back because you know I certainly want this to have some warmth. Um, using Cinema 4D's color picker, we can actually choose a Calvin value, but anyway. So that's uh, the first material. And then the second material is a glass preset in which I increased the roughness and the samples and let's send that out to the node so you can see that and this really hits the render time um, we're gonna i'm gonna get into this in more detail tomorrow why i decided to do it uh, the way that i did um, but those are the two materials and the blending like i said was that vertex map right there. We simply use the Cinema 4D vertex map node. So if I go to search vertex, oops, you'll see there's actually vertex attribute and then the Cinema 4D vertex map node. That's the one, the Cinema 4D vertex map. Um, so uh, I added that and then told it to use um, that uh, vertex map as the material blender's blend color. Uh, so this is actually refreshing. Um, and then we get that, that blending there. Um, minutes left. Uh, so I'm actually going to break or tease you uh, with how I did those spider webs. Um, so let's come out here. And let's go like over here. And, oh, that's, that's pretty big. Let's pull this over. Gosh, I wish I wasn't working on my laptop so that I had more real estate to be working in right now. Um, so, you know, the, the spider webs was actually a really interesting problem, and I'm not totally happy with it, but um, it's, I'm, I'm well, but I am happy with where, where it ended up. It's just enough um, to give me the feel that I'm looking for. And what I ended up doing was using uh, texture on basically a, a, a copy of the tiles cloner. So let me actually switch to the um, gray shader graph here. And I'm gonna go um, view personal hierarchy. So, I'm selecting the tiles cloner, um, so we'll see just that. And then I basically copied it and moved that copy down a bit. Okay, so this is, you know, all the same tiles just on a bit. And onto it, uh, I have the um, redshift material. And in the material, let's see, I'm just gonna move this over because I wanna show you the texture that I used. I'm gonna go to my catalogs. Uh, here we go. So unfortunately, I was not able to find a really good um, uh, source for 
textures that were free. <laughs> um, but I did find this one. And so I actually took these into Photoshop and I cut them out uh, so that I got all these separate textures. And let's get to the material here. There we go. Uh, here we go. And here I'm, uh, I have all of those loaded here, each one of those textures, okay? And they're all going into this shader switch node. Um, this is like a multi-shader. Um, now I have uh, here some uh, user data. This user data node is actually getting the MoGraph clone ID because those tiles, you know, it's one in a cloner. Um, so they all have their unique ID number. That's being sent out uh, into this RS mod node. And that is being used to choose uh, which clone gets which of these shaders. Uh, and then that shader is being sent into opacity color and translucency color. And then um, I actually added the displacement from the base tile onto here so that it was sort of, uh, you know, conform to um, the surface, like as if it were, um, uh, do, 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 you know, like dust or uh, cobwebs, not exactly spider webs, right? Uh, let's turn off solo. Um, and, yeah, it added just enough interest. I was happy with it. Now, um, let's see, let's refresh. This looks awkward. So that was really quick. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to actually get into the lighting, the um, creating the environment, and uh, the post effects of this render. Um, let's get that render back up. But I hope this is sort of helps you guys and gals that are getting into Redshift um, and uh, gives you some ideas and some tips. And um, yeah, I think with, with that, I'm gonna call it a day. I don't know how you managed to cram in all of that into an hour. <laughs> barely, <laughs> that was, barely. Just, that was quite a feat. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's a um, nice spiderweb trick as well. I like that. Oh, thank you. I wish it's, it's interesting that. Them. Oh, sorry, go on. You know, I, I tried many different things. Um, there's a Cineversity video on making spider webs. There's a Cinema 4D plugin to create spider webs, which is spoiler alert, buggy. Um, but that my favorite um, technique was to use texture maps. It gave me the most control with the uh, least amount of. Um, you know, hassle and is this working right? Do I know how to use it? So. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there's, as you mentioned before, there's so many ways to approach many of these topics. So it's just nice to have an, like a view into your creative process as well. Had some, some nice comments from the questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, thanks, Richard. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Drake. So, uh, Miss. This is this is good stuff. Thank you again, Darren, for sharing your knowledge. My pleasure. Thanks for uh, thanks for asking me, inviting me to do this. This has been oh, I, I, I don't do webinars, so this has been very cool. Well, you'd say that, but you've done many, many of the tra training sessions, um, both remotely and in person yes, over the years. So, I and have. that's evident from all those various processes. I have. And you have the jokes to go with it. What did you say earlier on that next se tomorrow's session will be lighter? That's tomorrow's session. Okay, sorry everyone. Simon really wanted me to say this. Tomorrow's session, <laughs> good news, is going to be lighter than today. Pun intended, right? Because it's lighting. Okay. <laughs> um, I think I have an animation here because I do have another goal for this. So we will get there someday. Oops. 
Yeah. Sorry, continue, Simon. My bad. I lost your audio there for a second, Darren. Uh oh. Okay, I'm going to uh, stop oh, back. sharing and get my webcam up. Great. Okay. Fantastic. Um, and I've just posted the link in the um, in the notes to say that if you want any follow-up questions, please email training at maxon.net, and um, we'll <laughs> see if we can help. Whatever your questions are. But great, hope to see you tomorrow. You've got access to that PDF and the link. We'll send you more information via email. All the links that Darren mentioned in the session today we'll be sending over as well. You'll get those shortly too. And you can watch oh. any of the recordings that we've done uh, can, today or yesterday. Sorry to interrupt. Um, one of those links is going to include a quick tip that I did um, back from Cinema 4D R18. It's an alternative way to do the triplanar uh, texture blending. Um, uh, because in previous versions, uh, that node had not yet been developed. Um, so check that out. Um, and also for, you know, our volume program, um, if you uh, are interested, we can set up a uh, custom uh, training going step by step through this rather than a breakdown as you've seen here today. So make sure you contact training at maxon.net. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, that's, that's the whole pro point of these we want to just give you a window in the fact that we do this for teams of people so please let us know excellent thanks also for bearing with us uh, only three minutes over today we're getting closer <laughs> one day we'll do it in an hour so thank you thanks everybody right. absolutely all right take it easy we'll see you on the next one thanks for bye. attending thanks, appreciate it all right bye bye